We have with us one of the grand old men of New Hampshire politics. At 78 years old, Happy Jack Chandler from Warner is going strong. He served 32 years in state government as a, a member of the House of Representatives, as a state senator, and as an executive counselor. He's been a newspaper publisher, he's owned a ski area, and he's never been afraid to speak his mind. We're going to talk about the history of his family, some of the famous men in New Hampshire politics who he's related to. Then we'll talk a little bit uh, about his own career, the people he's known, and his very forthright opinions on a number of subjects. Jack Chandler, welcome. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. You represent several generations of New Hampshire history, uh, and uh, probably the most prominent relative that many of us talk about from time to time is your great-grandfather, John P. Hale. Right, right. Tell us a little bit about Mr. Hale. Well, Hale was born in, in Rochester, New Hampshire, but he lived most of his life in Dover. And he went to Bowdoin College, and Franklin Pierce went there. They were in the same class. And they both graduated in the same class, and they came back, returned to New Hampshire, and they both became lawyers, and uh, they finally ended up running against each other for President of the United States. In 1852, I think, something like that. Right. Um, I was in Washington recently, and I happened to have a minute or two uh, of free time, so I went over to the old Senate chamber, which has been restored and is on display for people to come in and, and look over as a historical room. And uh, they have a booklet there, and I opened the booklet, and I saw a, a layout of the Senate at uh, one of its uh, prominent times in history when a lot of key figures were in the Senate, and I noticed that Daniel Webster of Massachusetts, born in New Hampshire, and your great-grandfather, John P. Hale, served in the Senate together. Did you ever have any stories through the family growing up where there was comment made about uh, your great-grandfather's career and his friendship with Webster and his problems with Pierce? I understand he had problems with Franklin Pierce. You know, we, I, I didn't have get stories from the family, but I've, I've read some things about him. And when I was going to uh, Governor Dummer Academy, I was about 12 years old and I was reading the Encyclopedia Britannica about John P. Hale and it said in there that he was involved in some scandal with the Queen of Spain and I often wondered for years I wondered what that was or how come I didn't know anything more about it and it didn't bother me too much but finally I found out what, a, what the scandal was and it was n nothing of a romantic nature. It was actually that he had brought in some American furniture for the Queen from this country, and he didn't pay any duty on it or something like that, see? And that's what the scandal was. Kind of small potatoes compared to what's happening today in the world. <laughs> right, I know it. It was only recently that I just found out what it actually was. It's interesting. I was reading a while back uh, Jim Bishop's famous book, The Day Lincoln Was Shot. And the last day of Lincoln's life, I understand, uh, John P. Hale visited Mr. Lincoln. He had just been defeated for the U.S. Senate and had, was uh, there meeting with President Lincoln on his appointment to be ambassador to Spain, which was the last position mm. he had. Mm. Um, it was an interesting reading. In the book, I also was reading about your grandmother's uh, relationship with John B Wilkes Booth. Right, yes. Well, uh, J John Parker Hale had two daughters, and one of them was my, turned out to be my grandmother, Lucy. And Lucy was engaged to be married to John Wilkes Booth. But when he shot Lincoln, that broke the engagement. And uh, uh, so Hale took his two daughters to Europe to try to get over the, the, the trauma of it and everything. But I also read somewhere that, that how Booth was able to get into the uh, Ford Theater and go up to where, where Lincoln was sitting was he had stolen one of my grandfather's calling cards from his, his table when he was visiting m my grandmother and he presented that card to the usher, well, pretending to be John P. Hale, and so the usher let him in. That's how he got up into, uh, was up in the balcony. Was there any problem with your grandmother, any investigation uh, at the time of the assassination? Was her name dragged through the mud, so to speak, because of her relationship? Was there anything like I that happening? I don't think so, no. I don't, I don't believe so. I, I think 
Booth had, had, didn't plot the whole thing all by himself. There was a group of people that were involved in it, but I don't believe she had anything to do with it. She was just a, a young, beautiful girl, and he was quite a ladies' man, and I don't think she was involved in any of that. It probably shook her up, you know, to be, be engaged to a man, come find out they killed the president. I probably, probably uh, upset her quite a bit, I imagine, but I don't know anything about the details of that. Now, John P. Hale, one of the things that we've known about him is he, uh, he was the first U.S. Senator, frankly speaking, to stand on the floor of the Senate to speak against slavery. Yes, he was an abolitionist. He wanted to abolish slavery. And he was the first U.S. Senator to be an abolitionist. And that is on the tablet on his statue in Concord that gives that information about that. For our viewers, there's a statue of John P. Hale in the park area in front of the State House. And Mr. Hale's portrait is one of the four, I think it's one of the four or five, actually, that, uh, that's, that is on display in Representatives Hall in, uh, in the State House in Concord. Now, he was a candidate for president against Franklin Pierce, and there was always some conflict between them because Pierce took more of the southern side of political issues of his day, and of course Hale was a real zealous person right. for, uh, for the abolitionist cause. Yes, and then, and then the question was when new states were coming into the Union, whether they would come in as free states or whether they'd come in as slave states. And Hale wanted them to come in as, as free states, any new states coming in. And uh, he wanted to abolish slavery, and he was the first U.S. Senator to take that stand. And uh, actually, he ran for president twice on a free soil ticket, free soil party. There wasn't any Republican party at that time. And he, he eventually became a, a Republican and he helped found the party along with my grandfather. The two of them helped found the party, the Republican Party here in New Hampshire. Now your grandfather was William E. Chandler who happened to marry this Lucy we were talking about. Yes. And yeah, he, uh, he was, he was uh, several years older than Lucy. And, and Lucy was a real belle of the, going to the da all the dances and everything. But my in Washington? In Washington, yeah, in Washington. My grandfather, William E. Chandler, he, he was married before. He, his first wife was Ann Gilmore, who was daughter of Governor Gilmore here in New Hampshire. That was his first wife. And he had four boys by her, and then she died in childbirth. And then he married Lucy, and had one boy by Lucy, and that was my father. Family came from Bosquine, goes back quite a few years. And between the Chandlers and the Hales and the Parkers, that gave me enough ancestors so I was able to join the Sons of the American Revolution. I was a state president of the Sons of the American Revolution in New Hampshire for two, two terms. And uh, I also belonged to the Society of Colonial Wars. And I suppose the Chandlers came into, into Strawberry Bank down in Portsmouth originally, and then they got up into Bosquine. And, uh, his summer home was in Warner, and that's how that, uh, my father, who was the son of William E. Chandler, met my mother in Warner because she was a Boston girl, and they came up there summers for vacation. They got acquainted up there. Now, William E. Chandler, who we're talking about yeah. now, the, the son-in-law of John P. Hale, yes. he was a U.S. Senator also. He was the Secretary of the Navy, he was Secretary of the Treasury. Right. He was a founder of the uh, Concord Monitor, I understand. Uh, and, and the Rumford Press. He had a habit of marrying some pretty prominent ladies, didn't he? He married a uh, governor's daughter, and she passed away, and then uh, a U.S. senator's daughter. Right. I know it. He seemed sure. to be on to something. Yeah. He, he must have been a pretty good man. <laughs> he had to be. <laughs> um, he was a contemporary of Teddy Roosevelt's, I understand. Yes. But Teddy came up and visited him in Warna. He lived in the Waterloo section of town, and they came up there, and Teddy was, came up there and went fishing together, and uh, they played poker together, and my grandfather was one of the founders of Corbett Game Reserve up in Croydon, and I, I think probably he took Roosevelt up there hunting. 
They had w wild boar in there, and they had all kinds of animals in there. This yeah. kind of got you involved, is it? did it not? Uh, we don't meet many people who've spent almost their whole lives in, in public life. Uh, did, is, is this background what inspired you to get involved in politics and as a publisher yourself? Well, I, I grew up uh, partly in New Hampshire and partly in Boston. And I went, went, went to prep school in Massachusetts, and I went to college in Massachusetts. I understand you're a Harvard man. Yes, yes. And my father was too. He was in the class of 1907, I was in the class of 1934. And so when I graduated from college, my mother wanted me to go to law school. My father went to Harvard Law School too. And my mother wanted me to go to, but I've had so many years of schooling that I was sick of it, so I went to Europe instead. And I was over there for six months. And then when I came back, I found out that Jim Curley was governor of Massachusetts, so I left the state. <laughs> Never to return, right? <laughs> and I came up to Warner and settled, I bought a house, and settled down in the town where, where, where Chandler had lived. How many years did you publish your little newspaper? You had a weekly, didn't you? Uh, 17 years. It was the Kearsarge Independent. That's named after Mount Kearsarge. It's in, the summit is in Warner. And 17 when, years. When was your first uh, term in, in the House of Representatives? Was it in New 1943? And you served how many terms in the House? Six altogether, but not consecutively. Okay. I, I was in 43 and 45, and then in 47 I went into the Senate. At that time, the Republicans in, in that district rotated the, the Senate around so that one time uh, somebody from the towns would be senator, and the other time somebody from Concord would be senator. So I only served one term. I didn't run again because it was the Concord's turn. But then later in life, oh, you went back to the Senate. Later I went back, I went back a couple of times, yes. More than a couple. <laughs> you were, I think, in the... Well, well you, you served, what, how many terms in the Senate? Five terms? Seven terms seven. in the Senate. Seven in the Senate Which altogether. is 14 years. Right. And you served three terms on the council. Under Lane Dwinell was? Council for three terms. The first two terms were under Governor Gregg. Hugh the Gregg. Father, the, Hugh Gregg, the father of our present governor. And then I served four years under Governor Dwinell. And he and I are both members of the Sons of the American Revolution. And we were very good friends. Which job did you like best? They're, they're all three are different. The House, the Senate, and the Council, all three different. But which did you like best, though? Hard to say. What are the, I some I just, uh, the, the um, When you're on the Governor's Council, you get invited to all kinds of functions and banquets and this and that and the other thing. And Hugh Gregg, in his first term, his only term, he said he would not attend any of those while the legislature was in session. He felt it was his job to be in the state house, and so he used to send me out to represent him all over the state at, at different kinds of meetings and 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 banquets, and uh, and I represented Hugh Gregg quite a few times. Well, Jack, uh, mm -hmm. I, you know, I served in the House and you were in the Senate. We used to get along pretty well and worked together pretty well. You're known and have been known in these recent years. Uh, to my generation, is a very, very strong advocate of some pretty important issues. What are some of the issues that are important to you even now? Well, one thing I thought that, that we should re repeal the interest and dividends tax because of the discriminatory, it only taxes one kind of income and one kind of people. And uh, with, we brag that we don't have an income tax in New Hampshire. But we do. That's an income tax that only hits retired people. I also have opposed repealing the abortion law, and uh, I, I worked very hard on that, and the first bill to repeal it came in before Roe Wade passed the House, and it came in the Senate. Well, was, I just happened to be chairman of the Public Health Committee in the Senate that session, and it came to my committee, and there was five of us on it, and I held it in the committee for, for a couple of months, and it came out unanimously opposed to that bill. And we brought it on the floor of the House and we killed it. I killed wasn't. it in the Senate, you mean? You killed it in the Senate, yes. right. Jack, we've been talking about your family, your heritage, pretty impressive, and your own career. Uh, you've served 32 years in state government. 
Who are some of the luminaries that you've worked with? Well, Who do you think are the most <clears throat> capable people you've worked with? Well, I was in the house when Norris Cotton was in the house. And he was a great speaker. And there was my first term in the house, there was 425 members. And that's when they changed the formula to, for house members so that it would not be, not keep on growing and growing. To, to pe peg it at 400 members. And, but, but if it go kept on going the way it was, there'd be a thousand members in the house by now. So we changed the formula. And Norris Cotton was a man that could get up there and he could actually sway the house. He, he was a great speaker and a great orator and, and when, when everybody listened to him and he could really change them around, change their mind and everything. That's, that's a hard thing to do. Most of the people, especially in the Senate, all the senators usually got their minds all made up ahead of time. And you can talk to the blue in the face and you don't change anybody. Who else do you think uh, well, stands out in your Well, of course, Sherman Adams was speaker in my first term. And he was, he was a, a, a smart man. And uh, they say he was kind of a hard nosed person. Oh, yeah, right. I know it. He, he, he wasn't very friendly. He wasn't a friendly type. But uh, he, he uh, had served in Congress and then he came back and became governor. And then he went to Washington as Eisenhower's right hand man. Kind of like Sununu is now to that, Bush. That's right. Some, somewhat the same thing, idea, yes. Uh, how do you uh, how do you size up Sununu? Uh, you worked with him for years. Uh, <clears throat> Personally, I know him quite well, and uh, we have a good relationship. And and to be honest with you, I think he's the smartest man I've ever known in my life. He can grasp a situation in in a minute or two, and he not only seems to know all the facts, he can come up with the answers. And uh, I, I've known every governor since Governor Blood, and I, uh, John Sununu has, has got the greatest mental powers and, and ability that anybody that I've ever known. Did you, uh, now you went to some uh, Republican conventions and you've been involved in uh, nominating uh, and electing presidents. Did you ever get close to any presidents, really? Not after they got elected. I was <laughs> close to them when they were campaigning. And then I, they forget and, you, huh? And I, tra I traveled all over the state with Goldwater in automobiles and airplanes and so forth and so on. And my wife was, was escorting Mrs. Goldwater around. And, uh, but I, 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 after they became president, I never tried to follow through and, and, and bug them or anything or to go to the White House. I never, never did it. But I, I, I've been in every presidential campaign involved one way or another. And I've also attended five Republican national conventions. And I'm the only man in New Hampshire that was pledged to Richard Nixon three times. Nobody else in the state was a delegate, a Nixon delegate three times. Did you work with Nixon when he came up and campaigned all through as vice president in the 50s and in the 60s? Uh, I, was, I was working with him, in a, and I was working in, his head, in the headquarters in Concord and Eagle Hotel. There's three of us who were running a campaign from there one time. What do you think of him? Well, I, I thought he, I was, of course, I was a good, strong supporter of, of his, and I think he really made a mistake by getting involved in, what, in, what, in some of the things he did. Jack, what about your future? Uh, there's rumors going around that you're thinking of going back to the Senate or attempting to. Uh, what do you, uh, what's in your future? You're 78 years old, but you look 60. <laughs> well, I tell you, my future's in the past. And I don't know really what I will do. A lot of people have, want me to get back in the State House again. And uh, they've talked to me about it. And a lot of times, I, it seems to be wherever I go, people will ask me, you're going to run again, Jack? I wish you would run. So on and so on, and I said, well, I don't know. See, I at the uh, the day after the primaries last time, I told my opponent who beat me that I wouldn't run next time. And uh, the main reason was was a financial reason. I got sick of throwing in so much money every two years, so I thought I'd stay out of it and help out my bank account. I, I told my opponent that I wouldn't run next time, and they said, well, 
you've got a right to change your mind. It's a free country. You can change your mind. Now, Jack, yeah. you, you have spent a lot of money in the past, fifty, sixty thousand dollars a race sometimes for a state senate race. Are you leaning towards it or, or well, what? Well, I'm still thinking it over. You know, I, I got to think of my health and I got to think of other things. You look like you got a lot of fight left in you to me. <laughs> Listen, well, we've had an, a wonderful chat with one of the senior members of uh, the political world in New Hampshire, Jack Chandler. I'm Dean Dexter.